Hey, welcome back to Youth Snap YouTube channel. We have Mr. Brent Cash from Yay GPA tutoring with us today to give our students some recommendations and strategies for studying for the SAT. We hope this session is helpful for you. And don't forget to subscribe below. Um, and so one thing in particular that I always mention to my students that, that uh, can benefit students right off the bat is building your vocabulary. I think all of my students, uh, on day one when I meet them, um, they they want to they want to become stronger readers. And I always say that there's two things you can do. One is you have to learn how to take good notes. Uh, and I would also encourage you guys to take notes on what I'm about to present to you today. Um, you know, even if it's the last time I hear from you, I hope that you will find something of value. And we're gonna. <clears throat> what I'm going to do is show you what I call my uh, marking system for an SAT reading passage. So I'm going to actually give you some real strategies, some real-time strategies that you can carry forward. The first thing that uh, you'll want to do is build up your vocabulary. Your vocabulary is more important than anything when it comes to building up your reading comprehension. A lot of students can only go so far because they don't spend the time to build up that vocab, especially if you're young early on. Um, any of the um, vocab books will do uh, that you can find there are a variety out there. Um, I recommend um, looking for books that, uh, that you can follow and that you would enjoy. Go to the library first and see what vocab books are out there. Make sure that there's a discussion about root words I'm going to pay attention to root words as well. But again, that's, that's just my typical rant about vocab because students really don't focus on it enough and it's hard, it's hard to progress to the next level without a strong vocab. With that said, I always want students to keep a running vocabulary list. Uh, you're going to run into words in your daily lives reading. Um, in this passage I'm about to break down for you, you're going to run the words you don't know. Well, jot the word down. This is how you learn vocab. Jot the word down, write a sentence using that word, and then the next day, see if you can't write that word from memory. So just a quick vocab strategy. I'm going to share my screen here. Uh, this is going to be a PSAT, a real life PSAT that was given out um, around 2016. I have a copy of this exam as well. So if anybody wants a copy of anything I've done today, um, I will certainly send it over. And many of my students, uh, you guys know I have a, a special marking system. Um, when it comes to marking a passage, we can't just read and just sort of blow through the passage. Uh, what we have to do is you want to pause, especially when you're practicing. Um, don't go for speed. This is, this is one mistake students make in the very beginning of their SAT studies. They go for speed. Your objective when you're practicing is not to go for speed. Go for reading comprehension. And one thing we're looking out for is going to be, I'm going to put a couple notes at the top here. The three key things we're looking for, the author's tone. And remember what I said about taking notes, guys. Take notes, please, please. And I'll also send out, um, for anybody who wants it, a recap of, of what I talked about. So if you're not, if you missed something, I have no problem um, emailing you a recap of, of what I've talked about. The author's tone is something we're going to look out for. And as you see on the SAT, there's not too much space. So we keep track of the author's tone quite simply using a plus minus system. So plus if it's positive, minus if it's negative. Tone is mainly going to be in like an argumentative passage. So like fiction or an argument. There are many different types of passages on the SAT. Your first passage is always fiction. Um, 
Your second one is usually some, tor some type of argumentative or historical passage. But here we have a bit of a science passage. You could have some positive or negative tone in here um, as well, but not always. Um, and the thing that we're looking at for our transitions. And typically when, when an author transitions, we're looking for the fanboys. A lot of you have, have probably heard about the fanboys and um, what they do. Fanboys connect two sentences with a comma. And so the fanboys are big transition. We also look for words like however and because. We tend to circle these words. You wanna circle your transitions and then underline all the way to the period. We do that so that we know where in the passage to look back. Basically what we're doing to, to try and score high on the reading section is to map out the areas there, thanks for me. Um, and so I'll, I'll, I'll kind of pick up. So basically the, the major things we're looking for, author's tone, and we just use a simple plus minus system. And you can always tailor these strategies to, to your own way, but we must identify the author's tone. We have to identify the author's use, typically where we're going to find information. And it's important to note the things that are of interest in science, so things like a hypothesis, results, and a conclusion. And we wanna identify these things with like an H, an R, and a C. And by creating a map, uh, this will help us understand where the important things are in a passage. And so I'm gonna, go through this and, and sort of pinpoint some of these things I've been talking about. And again, um, I can provide a copy of this afterwards and, and how I would have marked this up, but just try and follow along. Um, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to read the entire thing. Uh, I just want to help pinpoint some of these things I'm talking about. So again, we're looking out for uh, the author's tone. We're looking out for hypothesis, results, and conclusions buzzwords like that. We're looking for transitions, particularly the fanboys and things that appear at the comments. And so in this first paragraph, um, in another example of how the return of a top predator can have far reaching ecological effects, researchers have found, so you see this, researchers have found that the reintroduction of the gray wolf to Yellowstone National Park has boosted an important food source for the threatened grizzly bear. Now, this is interesting. Um, this is something that the researchers have already found. So we can categorize this kind of as like an early conclusion. So I put a C in the margin. And then what you want to do is go ahead and underline. So we know to look here. Researchers have found that reintroduction of the gray wolf has boosted an important food source for the threatened grizzly bear, and you underline all that. The idea is not to overmark your passage. So just make sure you keep it high level. A study published in the Journal of Animal Ecology is essentially a tale of who eats what. When wolves were reintroduced to the park in 1995, after a seven year absence, they preyed on elk herds that browsed trees and shrubs. The elk population, you see this comma in this witch. Now, witch is not a fanboy, but this is good enough for me to consider this to be a bit of a transition or an additional detail. So you circle this word, which had exploded without the wolves. So the elk population exploded without the wolves. Take a pause and realize what you're reading and thinking and hearing. The overbrowsed plants began to rebound. We got another comma. We'll grab this, transitioning into more detail or different thought. 
including berry producing shrubs that provide nutritious summer meals for grizzlies when they are fattening up for hibernation. So you see just in those first two paragraphs, the power of what an annotation can do is allows us to employ a technique known as active reading. We call this active reading is moving all these motions tell you connect an idea is on the SAT, you just keep telling that same story. Don't think the exam's trying to fool you. If it, if it feels easy in the reading section, it's okay. Don't think that they're trying to fool you. You keep picking the same answer if you see it. Now, I'm not saying skip to the answers. You're supposed to go through the whole thing, all right? But this is just the abridged version. So let's imagine Question 20 in particular says, according to the passage, what was a direct result of the drop in the elk population at Yellowstone National Park? So if we think about our markings, right? I remember something was mentioned about elk that I had marked. So you can go back to your markings. We trust our markings more than anything. Trust your annotations more than anything. So a direct result of the drop in elk population. Here, population lines ask you according to the passage. Make sure you directly pull info according to the passage. So, for number 20, we can clearly pair this with choice C an increase in the fruit bearing plants. And then we have these tricky evidence questions, but we knew where to look. That was lines 11 through 15. So we can simplify the exam just like that. And I promise that this strategy I apologize for the uh, connectivity issues. All right, and so that's kind of a high level. Again, it, you know, the, the, markings, the marking strategy carries over to all different sorts of types of passages. So what are the major takeaways? What are the major takeaways? I'll just jot the major takeaways from, for improving reading comprehension. First and foremost, you gotta be hungry for vocabulary. Keep a running vocab book, a running vocab list, and in vocabulary, study your roots, study your Latin and Greek roots. The second thing is develop a marking system. Develop a marking system. And that's where, that's where you know, someone like a tutor can help you identify what, what you don't understand well. In this marking system, um, we're looking for you know, rhetoric that the author is using. We're looking for tone. We're looking for transitions. And 
And then the last thing um, that I really want to beg all of you to do is read a good book. Do some outside reading. Keep a good book in your hands. I got plenty of suggestions. I prefer the classics, the same things you're reading in school. Uh, Great Gatsby, Lord of the Flies. You can start small with those and build your way up to some of the more interesting classics. Uh, but you got to keep doing outside reading, especially books that have challenging vocabulary. So these are sort of some high-level strategies for improving your reading comprehension. And I'm going to move to... Too far. I'm going to move to the grammar here. Um, just to give you a, a taste of the grammar. Now, the, the grammar section, it tends to be uh, fairly difficult for a lot of students. Why? Because on the grammar section, um, they're testing the fundamental grammar rules. And from your, from your school system, or the school system rather, it has sort of cut out grammar courses. This has created a problem um, for a lot of students as far as standardized testing goes. So there's a lot, there's a lot you guys can do actually uh, as far as self-studying without a tutor, without anybody to help prepare yourself for the grammar section or to get stronger in it. I would go get a, <clears throat> a good book on fundamental grammar. Like my students, you know, I'm hoping when I work with my students that they come in with an understanding of the parts of speech. And you can even Google these things, make sure you know the eight parts of speech, but come in with all these, come in with all these fundamentals already known. You can get a good simple book on just fundamental grammar. Um, I keep a couple, I got uh, mastering workplace skills here. Grammar Fundamentals. I think this is a good high level book. Just give you the basics, at least read through the something like this for starters. And then we can worry about the, the harder materials or the harder questions, but you gotta come in with speaking the language of grammar. And again, it starts with knowing the parts of speech and working through a simple workbook like that. And then you'll be ready. You'll, 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 the uh, section two in the SAT will feel more manageable. And practice, practice, practice. Practice your essay writing. That's the best way is to, to improve your grammar. <clears throat> Even ask your teacher if you can maybe do an additional essay once a month that they're willing to grade mainly for grammar. See if they'll do it. Um, because it will improve you. These are all things you can do on your own. <clears throat> now you get to me. Uh, Some of these things expecting a student to kind of know a little bit and again there's so many different angles that the test can attack grammar wise and we'll go through one through 11 here i'll show you exactly what i mean so number one here we always read the passage we don't ignore anything that the passage states some people they say do i have to uh but they asked me, um, don't I just read the questions and skip around? No, you have to improve your reading speed so that you can be able to get to all the questions. And again, improving your reading speed, same recommendations I had earlier. Read a good book, build your vocab, practice those words. <clears throat> so we have for the love of coffee here, a fairly simple passage. We'll check this out. Ever since introducing coffee, to Italy several centuries ago, we have a comma. It has been a ubiquitous part of Italian culture. So what this is, what this is doing here, I tell students focus on these commas. We have it, what I call the allowable sentence combinations. And so a lot of students, you have to understand where a sentence starts and stops. And sentences are, we call them independent clauses. 
It's a group of words that can stand independently on their own. Focus on the commas when you're determining combinations of sentences. The number one rule to keep in mind is to never have two sentences separated by a comma. That's bad. Don't go sentence, comma, sentence. This is called a comma splice. This is no good. That's a comma splice. We don't want that. But we can have what we call a dependent clause, a group of words that's not a sentence a comma and then a sentence. Because if we look after this comma here, that I just highlighted in blue, it has been a ubiquitous, ubiquitous means widespread. Again, they're gonna put these kind of words, vocab, vocab, vocab. It has been a ubiquitous part of Italian culture. That's a sentence, what we call an independent clause. So I know that this first part needs to be a dependent clause. And the best choice here ever since, if I choose choice, a, ever since introducing coffee to Italy several centuries ago, I don't have a subject. There's no subject here. I don't know who's introducing the coffee. That's a problem. So I wouldn't choose A. Choice B, ever since they introduced coffee to Italy several centuries ago. I wouldn't choose choice B here either. Um, one, uh, I don't know who they is. A good topic sentence is not going to have a pronoun. A pronoun is a reference, a nonspecific reference to a noun. And that's why I say knowing the parts of speech is big. We have to know the parts of speech. So B is no good. Ever since their introduction of coffee, again, choice C has a pronoun. Their introduction, I don't know who they is. But D makes sense. Ever since coffee was introduced to Italy several centuries ago, keeps it nice and general, and it avoids the vague pronoun reference. So we'll go with D here. Number two um, is another type of question that um, students tend to struggle with. And these are just pure transition questions. What you want to do is, is and I'll email you guys a resource of, of transitions that are commonly tested in the SAT. Make sure you truly know what the transitions mean. You can make these kind of questions uh, far easier by crossing off the transitions that mean the same thing. So if you can learn in chunks what different transitions mean, then you can just cross off the ones that mean the same thing. So let's start by doing that. Um, Okay, I see that no changes, however. I like to look down here. I know that however is a contrasting transition. Well, look at choice D, it says the word despite. Despite and however are so close in meaning when it comes to writing, I'm probably gonna just cross these off, you know? I'm not gonna think about those. So now I only have two choices to think about. Now the problem's much easier. I like to eliminate bad answers. So blank coffee is so central to Italian culture that one cannot visit any city or town in Italy without seeing several coffee houses. I think the author is going into more detail. So I like, in fact, seems like they're providing additional information about the statement that was just made. So I'm going to go with in fact, but simplify the transition questions, knock the transitions out that mean the same. Of course, you have to learn the transitions. So learn them by category, the general meaning of sets of transitions. And I'll email the attendees today a worksheet that'll help you do that. Such coffee houses have existed since 1640 when the first was established in Venice and blank sense. So here, they're testing whether or not we know what pronoun to use. So such coffee houses have existed. Notice your verb here, have. What I like to tell students is keep your verbs parallel, especially within the same sentence. 
Keep your verbs parallel and make sure your pronouns are matched up properly. Well, coffee houses is plural. Coffee houses is plural. So any pronoun reference to coffee houses has to be plural. So that means if you look at the answer choices here, well, we can get rid of A and B. And so such coffee houses have existed since 1640 uh, when the first was established in Venice and they have since. So Sort of same thing here. Keep the language parallel. Become a part of Italy's national identity. So again, have, have, because have and have are present tense. I got the day because we're talking about coffee houses, plural. Had is past tense, so I don't want to pick it. I want to pick it. It is not, so there's a temptation for some students to then try and skip all the way down number four. Don't do that. Make sure you read this because there are questions later that are going to test on content. It is not uncommon in Italy for people to make two to three trips a day to their favorite cafeteria. And often people are so selective about their coffee that they will frequent only one establishment. But it is not simply the coffee that creates such enthusiasm for coffee houses among those blank them. So again, another pronoun reference. So among those, those is plural. So it's not going to be loves. So I'm going to cross out loves. Loves is singular. Among those, <clears throat> now when we talk about people, the pronoun reference to people is either who or whom. It's not which. So I'm going to cross out which. So it's either who love or whom love. Okay. The difference between who and whom. We use whom when we don't know who we're talking about. We use who when we do know. Well, we know who we're talking about. We're talking about coffee enthusiasts. So it's among those who love them. Whom is when we don't really know. You've probably heard the phrase <clears throat> when you're addressing somebody in a letter, to whom it may concern, because you don't really know who, whose hands this letter is going to fall into. So that's when you use whom. But if you know, you say who. All right. So again, I'm not going to go through all of these. <clears throat> I don't hear any yawns yet. Maybe that's because everybody's on mute. That's a good thing. <laughs> but as far as what can I do about my grammar? All right, keeping it high level. What, what can you do right now, tomorrow, to improve your grammar? So one, as you see, you got to come in with the grammar fundamentals. You got to get the grammar fundamentals down. We got to get the grammar fundamentals down. And that starts with just a simple book because unfortunately they've dropped the fundamentals of grammar from school. You guys aren't going to see it. Get the grammar fundamentals down. And again, I'm talking about starting with... On the garage is broken, mm -hmm. but the car, I want another one. Mm -hmm. So, car, like, do you have, like, like, do you know how to spell it? I don't really know what to do. Hello, can, can we get a mute there? iPhone. Thank you. Um, so, for the grammar fundamentals, the parts of speech, make yourself aware, there are eight of them. Study them and learn them, parts of speech. Learn something simple like the transitions. Those are things you can do on your own. 
And then write essays, guys. Write essays. Find some adult with perfect grammar to revise and edit them. It's hard, it's hard to improve your grammar if, if, if you don't correct your own natural mistakes. Because if you keep making the same mistakes in your grammar, you're not going to get the ear for it. So have an adult or somebody with perfect grammar revise your essays, even if it's the ones in school. Or ask your teacher, if I write an additional essay a week, are you willing to just look at it for grammar? You don't have to look at it for content. Just tell me, do I use my commas correctly? Tell me, do I use my pronouns correctly? I have a hard time believing every teacher is going to say no. Or there might be some type of English honor society with some of the students in there. You should be able to ask them, somebody. All right. And that's what we can do about grammar today. Now I'm going to touch on the math a little bit. Just kind of touch on a lot of different things today. Give me some high level tips. Now, as far as the math uh, goes, um, the SAT and ACT, they only go up through algebra two. Um, they, they say it goes to pre-calculus. It doesn't, it doesn't go to pre-calculus. So a lot of you can <clears throat> sometimes get worried like, oh, well, I don't, you know, I'm not, I'm not in pre-calculus or whatever. It, it doesn't matter. Um, it's mainly algebra one, geometry and algebra two. Even if you haven't taken algebra two yet, it doesn't test even the harder concepts in algebra two. There's sort of a finite number of things they test. Um, they really love testing um, things like y equals mx plus b if you're in algebra, in geometry, angles, triangles. Um, so what can you do uh, to, to improve your, <clears throat> your math skills? Um, well, in math, practice makes perfect. Practice makes perfect. Um, and you, you're probably not going to like this, but go grab an algebra one, grab an algebra one, geometry, algebra two book, and do all the word problems. Word problems, the SAT and ACT both are very, very heavy on word problems. So you, you got to get good. And then create an equation sheet. Anything and everything you come across, create a master equation sheet. You can master the TI-83 or TI-80, whatever. I think they're at like TI-92. I don't know what they're at. Master your TI-84 calculator. <clears throat> Sorry for my handwriting. These are the things we can do right away uh, to improve our math skills and, and, and really learn how to rock the SAT. Other than that, it's just practice. Um, you know, it really helps to have a friend or a mentor or a tutor that can watch you and see what mistakes you make and quickly tell you what to do and who can find out what types of exercises you need to do to improve. Um, again, you can ask your teacher or friend. That's where a tutor could be useful. Now, <clears throat> I want to kind of give you the, uh, the golden rules uh, for math. Um, one thing we always want to do is factor when possible. I say to keep these three problem solving things in mind at all times. Factor when possible. Uh, distribute if it, the problem's already factored. 
And number three is combine like terms. Combine like terms. You know, if you see a 5X and a 3X, combine those, make it 8X. Simplify the problem as much as possible. Just make your lives a lot easier. And so <clears throat> I'll go to the middle of the test, some of the, some of the trickier things. Or some of the ones that um, I think are interesting. All right, so um, number six here says the equation y equals 36 plus 18x models the relationship between the height y in inches of a typical golden delicious apple tree in the number of years after it was planted what is indicated by the y-intercept of the graph. So I told you the SAT loves and ACT, they love y equals mx plus b. So for those of you taking algebra one, pay attention to when you get to this. You've probably already hit, hit it though, because in third quarter, y equals mx plus b. A lot of the word problems hinge just on this one formula. So if you're going to take one formula away today, it should be this. We can quickly identify M with words like per each. My pencil, turn my pencil back on. Per each and every. And then B, this is your start point. Something has already happened. It's also mathematically your Y intercept. So if we look at the equation they gave us, I'm just going to rearrange it. They gave us y equals 18x plus 36. So the y-intercept is this 36 here. <clears throat> and it's my start point. So you just need to think conceptually. As far as my start point goes, well, I'm modeling the height of an apple tree. So the 36, this is always the same unit always the same unit as y. So my, my unit for y is inches. So what this 36 tells me is that the starting height for this tree was 36 inches. Well, the starting height when, okay? When it was planted. So choice B makes logical sense. Now let's say they ask us a question about the 18. That would be, the number of inches it grows per year. So look at choice D, the number of inches a typical apple tree grows each year. You see this word each? See? Per each every. These are the buzzwords that play in the Y equals MX plus B. They love Y equals MX plus B. Look at number eight. This is, this is Y equals MX plus B as well. A line is graphed in the XY plane. If the line has a positive slope, and a negative y-intercept. So y equals mx plus b. So draw a graph. Give yourself a fighting chance on the exam. A negative y-intercept. Your y-intercept is on the y-axis. So somewhere in this territory, all right, we'll plot this point. There's a negative y-intercept. And then a positive slope. If a line has a positive slope, it's going to look like this. It's going to trend upwards. The line is trending upwards. Okay. So they're asking us which of the following cannot be on the line. So we got to know our quadrants, right? Here's quadrant one, quadrant two, quadrant three, quadrant four. We see the line is never in quadrant two. Now, what's special about quadrant two? In quadrant two, I have negative x values and a positive y value. <clears throat> so I'm never going to have any point in this line with a negative x value and a positive y value because it's in quadrant two. This line never hits quadrant two. So for eight, I want to pick b as in boy because b as in boy has a negative x value and a positive y value. So here, you know, you can strategize for the exam if you know what to look out for. 
again, just by having a really strong understanding of y equals mx plus b, we can understand how to do multiple problems. I could go through all this exam, I could probably find 15 questions related to just one concept. So don't be intimidated by the math. Go back to Algebra 1 and review. It's mostly Algebra 1, I promise. And if you can master those concepts, and if you stick to it, you're going to do well. You're going to do well. Simplify the exam for yourself. Strategize. Go through practice problems, practice exams. All right. You got Khan Academy. Khan Academy. It's a good free resource. The only thing about Khan Academy, you know, some of the stuff might be repetitive. And again, this is where I think a good tutor can come in to help you uh, piece together what you don't know and specifically work on where your weakness is. Otherwise, you could just keep doing the same thing over and over. Your time is probably better spent doing something else to enrich your education or to enrich yourself. But you can find different problem types. All right. And so that's, that's what I wanted to present today. Um, I'm happy to send a recap. Um, I know that the session is being recorded as well. Um, if anybody has any questions, I'd like to uh, field any questions that anybody may have. But again, just, just a high level look at sort of um, what goes on. Yeah, um, if you have any questions, uh, please do ask, you know, if you've tried this and something is bothering you or something like that, feel free. You can let Bright go for free. Too much experience, you know. <laughs> I feel like, you know, going back to school now. <laughs> seeing all the questions. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. All right, guys. Let's hear from you. Questions. Silent means that you guys understand. I have two questions, please. Go ahead, Prince. My first question is, so for the SAT of language arts, you recommend that we study a lot of the parts of speech? Absolutely. All right. I would, st I would start there. I would start just, you know, everybody can do that. Everybody should do that. If you can't name... If you, if you take a pencil right now and you can't write down the eight parts of speech right now, just Google it. Google it. You, you'll probably be shocked that you actually did know them. You just, they just kind of slipped your mind. But start there. That should start your, your quest for perfection in grammar. And then I would start with a little intro book. It, it's very hard to do the, the, the SAT grammar without a, a truly deep, understanding of the fundamentals because the SAT is not testing the fundamentals too much. They're testing the intermediate and advanced stuff. So get the fundamentals under your belt, be able to, to understand what makes a sentence. You need a subject and a verb predicate. See if that doesn't click with you, that means that the fundamentals aren't there. Get those first and then you can worry about your SAT studies. But if you learn the fundamentals of grammar, it'll go far longer in life, be far more helpful than banging your head with this stuff. Get the fundamentals under your belt. Make you a better reader, better writer. All right. Thank you. And my next question is for SAT for math, you said may, it would be mainly algebra two. I mean, major, maybe um, majorly algebra, algebra one, please. Yes, it's mainly algebra one and geometry. They say it goes up to pre-calculus. It's not true. It does not. Um, it depends on what kind of score uh, you're looking for, but there are some algebra two concepts. Um, every once in a while, they'll throw some exponents at you. You could argue that every concept on the SAT could be found in a difficult algebra one course. You could argue that. So if you understand the concepts of algebra one and geometry, you should be in pretty good shape. 
should be in pretty good shape. I mean, you have to understand it very thoroughly. All right, thank you. Any, any other questions, guys? So whilst um, we're waiting for anybody with any other question, um, Brent, uh, you know, as a professor, we have uh, students asking us questions like, uh, hey, um, I hear we don't need any SAT or ACT anymore in applying, you know, just, just an indirect question just to help us folks, you know, here. Um, what, what, what's your take about that? Because people don't know that, you know, although it's on there saying that, I mean, the school doesn't require SAT or ACT, you know, you won't get the scholarships, you know, and all that. So what, what's your take on that just for, for the parents? Yeah, I think that's, that's a great question. That's, that's kind of the elephant uh, in the room right now. Um, so many colleges, well, because of COVID, they, they went test optional. Before COVID, though, let's, let's, start, let's start the timeline before COVID, when um, there was already pressure on many universities to drop the exam, saying that it's unfair. Some people just don't do well at it. Some people don't have the resources to do well at it, which are all legitimate and fair concerns. So you had, I think the biggest name school to, to drop the exam, which was almost an Ivy League caliber, University of Chicago. They were the first to sort of drop the exam and say that, you, you know, it's test optional. And they, that university has reported that things are going well. And then you had COVID, which forced most universities to go test optional. And then that followed by the state of California, which no longer allows its public universities to even use the SAT or ACT. So the dominoes are falling as far as standardized testing for the SAT and ACT. But here's what's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. What the federal court said in California was that the states can create their own test. This could potentially be a nightmare because if you want to apply to a college in different states, you now might be taking California's SAT, New York's SAT, or the state I live in, Maryland's SAT. This is incredible stress. And let's say that that doesn't even happen. You still have AP scores, which is another form of standardized exam. Now those are going to carry more weight. The schools are going to, the university is going to find a way to separate because you got to think of yourselves. Everybody has a 4.0 GPA these days. The schools want something. They don't want to lose the SAT. The universities want to keep it. And look no further than what happened in California. The federal courts had to force them to stop using it. It was the universities fighting against the courts. So if the universities want it, they'll just find some other way. So it's not going away. They'll find something else or they'll make their own test or they'll use AP exams, which to me is even more unfair. But what if I don't go to a school that offers a lot of AP courses? Or what if I don't go to a school that has the right professors that I can learn from to succeed on the AP exam? I don't know what to do about it. Do I think the SAT is perfect? No, it'll be a tremendous risk not to take it. It'll be a tremendous risk to buy into the optional. Okay. Great, great. Thank you. Um, any, any other questions now um, regarding what uh, he said about the algebras and uh, the English side? I know Prince asked two questions. What about, Dominic, do you have anything here, mommy? Are you guys here? I've gone through this already, so please. <laughs> I don't have any questions. You don't have any questions? Yeah, I don't have any what questions. About, what about mommy? Mommy doesn't have any questions. Uh, who's Beryl? Uh, Beryl, uh, well, do you have any questions? Mesa? Um, I don't have a question, but I have like a comment. Please do. A statement. So when you were talking about the grammar section, mm -hmm. um, like you said, like, no, like, keep the pronouns the same and, like, the verse parallel. I found that really, like, helpful because when I was taking, like, the practice test, like, I really, like, it's, it's important to know, like, the parts of speech. I mean, not the parts of speech, like, present tense and, like, past tense because that kind of, like, messed me up. Like, 
that part was like the second part the grammar section was kind of like like weird for me but it was like important to know like the had and like the have and like which one's like past tense and like the pre present tense so that was really like helpful for what you said happy to hear that happy to hear that yeah it, it, it could be confusing and um the grammar section is tricky because it's, it's the section you have to go the fastest on you have the least yeah. time for questions so you got to know it like the back of your hand you know yeah yeah okay. mesa do you have any question mesa uh no no who else? Uh, iPhone. I don't know who iPhone is. Uh, can you identify yourself? Uh, I don't know whether it's a parent or a student here. Do you have any question, iPhone? Uh, no, I'm a parent. I don't have a question. Oh, okay. This is Evelyn. Yes. Oh, hi, Evelyn. Okay, good. Yes. Hi, Evelyn. All right. So, uh, what will be your closing remarks, uh, Brent? Um, any advice uh, moving forward? Yeah, I think. I think um, find the right study plan, you know, for, for yourself, your son, or your child. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't put I wouldn't put too much pressure. Um, I wouldn't put too much pressure on myself or on my on my son or my daughter. Um, you know, just to study for this exam, to think of it as just an SAT or ACT thing, and it's optional now. It doesn't matter. It's, these are concepts now that will apply in, in everything you do. Mm -hmm. Don't look at it like that, but do put pressure on yourself to become a better reader. Is that a good idea? I think so. Put pressure on yourself to become a better writer. Put pressure on yourself to become a better mathematician. If you, if you, if you do those things, um, you're going to find yourself succeeding on the SAT because, again, th there was nothing here presented today that should have been mind-blowing, um, but it takes work.